This here is a wireless charger that I bought from eBay. Together with this, which is the transmitter, I also bought the receiver, which is this other part. We can connect this to our smartphone charging plug, and when I place the receiver on top of the transmitter, my phone is charging wirelessly. So how does this work? What is the magic of the magnetic induction? How does the coil and capacitor resonance affect the circuit? How to measure the coil inductance? Detect the frequency? What are the power losses? Is this circuit any good? And a lot of other questions will be answered in this video about wireless chargers. We will take a look at the transmitter components. Then at the tiny receiver components. We will make some tests that will help you understand better some basic fundamentals. Finally, I will try to build my own crude wireless charger using everything that I've learned and I hope that you will also learn something on the way. I will test this homemade version and charge my smartphone with it with a USB output. We will also discuss the problems of such technology. So guys, let's get started. Video sponsored by GLC PCB. They have services for PCB manufacture of 2, 4 or 6 layers, starting from only $2 for 5 PCBs of 100 by 100 mm. Other services are the stainless steel stencil for soldering with solder paste and the SMT assembly where they will solder the components for you automatically using high technology machines for a professional finish. So just go to glcpcb.com. Upload the Gerbers, select what you want and place the order in a couple of minutes. What's up my friends, welcome back. To understand how wireless charging works and then be able to get into more details, we first need to understand the magnetic induction, which I know it sounds basic, but let's give it a brief recap. Here I have a copper wire. If I apply voltage to its ends, current will pass through the wire. This current flow will create around the wire a magnetic field. This magnetic field is not only in one zone, but is created along the entire wire and in a circular way around it, and I hope these animations will help you understand the concept. But now if I wind this copper wire into a loop, look what happens. As you can see, the magnetic fields revolving around the wire are now merging together. In this way, we would have a maximum magnetic field in the middle. And if I make even more loops, the fields are summing together more and more. So that's how, in a manner of speech, we can center the power in the middle of the coil. But this is not magnetic induction yet. That is the reverse process. So if I apply current to a loop, it will generate a magnetic field. But if I do the opposite and pass a magnetic field inside of a loop, it will induce current into the wire of that loop. So this is called Faraday's law of induction. But there is more, a static magnetic field won't induce current into the secondary loop. I connected my power supply to this copper coil, so it will create a magnetic field, since as you can see, it attracts the metal sheet. I place the secondary coil on top, but there is no voltage induced at the output of the secondary. But why? We have a magnetic field and we have a coil. Why there is no current induction? Because to induce current in the secondary, we need the magnetic flux to change. For example, if I connect and disconnect the power supply, the magnetic field will increase and then decrease. So only on these fast changes we can see a small current induction in the secondary. So we need alternating magnetic fields. So to send power from one coil to the other, we need to have this alternating voltage applied to the primary. That's what we know so far. Here I have a test. With my function generator, I apply fast pulses to this primary coil. Now I take the secondary and solder an LED at the output. The closer I get to the primary, the brighter the LED will get. So we are sending power wirelessly. There is no connection between the supply and the LED, but still, the LED is turning on. So far, so good. But this is not that easy as connecting my smartphone directly to the coil. Why? Well, first of all, the voltage. Smartphones are charging at 5V DC. The output from the secondary is oscillating, so this is AC. At the same time, we don't know the output voltage from the secondary. It could be higher or lower than 5V. 
and also if I move the coil, the voltage will change. But this smartphone needs steady voltage. So for sure we will need to regulate the output from the secondary, and later we will see how. Another thing to have in mind is the efficiency, and that is affected by the signal frequency as well. For the test before I was switching the coil at a random frequency, but for the best couple between the coils, we need to oscillate it at the resonating frequency. So what is this resonating frequency? Well, here I have a coil connected to a capacitor in parallel. This creates a so-called LC tank. I connect 5 volts to the terminals so the capacitor will charge up. But look what happens when I release the 5 volts. We get these oscillations. The frequency of these oscillations is affected by the coil inductance and capacitor value, and this is the resonance frequency of this LC tank. This frequency is given by this formula, so if we know the capacitor value and the coil inductance, we can calculate the resonating frequency. And by the way, this is how you could calculate a random coil inductance using the oscilloscope. You take for example a 100 nanofarad capacitor. Then you connect the random coil. You apply a 5 volts pulse to the LC tank and then we measure the frequency on the oscilloscope. Then you put the capacitor value and the frequency into this formula and voila, we get the inductance value. Ok, so to make the transmitter I propose this circuit. The coil and the capacitor here will create the LC tank, and using a MOSFET we can keep switching the coil, and this automatically will create the resonating frequency. I mount the simple circuit on a PCB with the coil at the output. I've placed a heat dissipator on the MOSFET as well. I supply this circuit at let's say 5 volts, and as you can see we get the oscillating signal. When we add a closed loop coil as a load, this will affect the transmitter LC tank parameters but the circuit will automatically change the new resonating frequency as you can see. So that's the nice thing about this circuit, it adapts automatically to the load. Now let's talk about the receiver. First of all, the turn ratio. If the transmitter and receiver have the same amount of turns, the ratio is 1 to 1, so the voltage at the receiver output should be the same as the transmitter. If you want a higher voltage, we should increase the secondary loops. To increase efficiency and canalize better the magnetic fields, we could add a ferromagnetic material inside of the loop. For example, this is the transmitter coil from a commercial charger. And as you can see, it has a metal disc below to better canalize the magnetic field. This here is the receiver coil. And I guess that you think this is just normal tape, but it's not. This is a very thin layer of ferromagnetic material. Look, I get closer to a magnet and is attracted. So for sure this is not plastic tape. Ok, so for now the output from the receiver is still AC, but to charge our devices we need DC. That's why the first component we need after the coil is a rectifier that is made with these diodes. This will pass from AC signal to only positive pulses, as you can see here on my oscilloscope. We have the output from the coil with yellow and the output from the rectifier with green. But we don't need pulses, we need steady DC. That's why we add a capacitor as a filter at the output of the rectifier. Now this will charge up and will give us a more or less steady DC voltage. But there is more. Even so, as you can see we have DC voltage, but the value could change depending on the receiver position and the distance from the transmitter. The smartphone needs 5 volts all the time. So in order to keep a constant output, we need a voltage regulator. For example, we could use an AMS1117 or the 7805 IC and regulate the output at 5 volts. As you can see, I've soldered the receiver circuit on a PCB and here we have the 5 volts AMS1117 regulator. Now as you can see when I couple the transmitter with the receiver, the output is now regulated at 5 volts, so that's it. Even if the receiver voltage overpasses 5 volts, the output now is always 5 volts. So now I have my steady DC voltage that we could connect to the smartphone input and charge it. So there you go, as you can see, I can charge my smartphone wirelessly. Nice. Usually some smartphones have this receiver circuit and the coil already inside of the phone case. But my smartphone doesn't have that, that's why I bought an external one. We plug this into our smartphone, we tape it on the back or below the protective case and that's it, we have a wireless charger receiver. 
So now let's take a look at what we have inside of this commercial wireless charger. We start with the transmitter. We have 5 volts input from the USB connector and then we have some sort of microcontroller or a driver. So why we have this, why not just the oscillator? Well this is to make the transmitter more efficient. Let's take a look at the signal from the transmitter on the oscilloscope. And as you can see, when we don't have a compatible receiver load, the transmitter makes a small pulse each one second. Because operating the transmitter without a load will be wasting power. But when I put on top the receiver as you can see, the signal starts oscillating without stopping and also the LEDs turn blue. So how does the transmitter detect the receiver? Well, that's very easy. Remember from before that when we couple the receiver, the resonating frequency will change. So the same will happen here. Look, the pulses are resonating at a frequency of 220 kHz. But when we have the receiver in place, the frequency lowers to around 107 kHz. So since we have a small microcontroller on the PCB, this could detect the change in the frequency or the change in the load, so it could activate the oscillating signal. And when I remove the load, we go back to small pulses and with that we consume less power in the standby mode. The transmitter PCB also have these two components, which are just two MOSFETs to create a switch. And at the coil input we have some capacitor to create the LC tank. The coil in this case is 10 turns and is glued on the back of this metal disc. And that's it, the circuit is very simple and the only difference between this one and our crude homemade version is the use of a microcontroller and a better circuit. Ok now let's see the receiver. This is very tiny, so it must use very small components. I remove the plastic cover and we can see the receiver coil inside. The receiver seems to have double the amount of loops. On this tiny PCB we can see the diodes for the rectifier, some filtering capacitors and an IC that must be in charge of the regulation process. That's how it creates 5 volts at the output. It's quite interesting to see such a compact circuit and a thin PCB that could fit in less than a millimeter thickness. Now the problem with this method of charging is the efficiency. If I measure the power going into the charger and the power going into the phone, we would see a dramatic loss in power. And that's because the efficiency is never 100%. But it's more. Efficiency sometimes could be from 80% down to even 60%. So basically we lose half of the power. And at the same time, the charging process will be a lot slower. If you power the transmitter from the USB cable, it's not that big of a deal. But for example, this wireless charger here is made to be powered from a battery bank, which is limited in power storage. So basically, using wireless charger, you will only be able to use half of the battery capacity. I know that wireless charging looks cool, but for charging phones is not the best and most efficient idea. But for maybe electric cars and other appliances, this could work better. So guys, that's how the wireless charger works and how you could make one yourself. See the schematic and more details in the video description on electronoops.com. Consider subscribing and activating the notification bell. Thanks again and see you later guys. Hey guys, Electronoops here. This is the end of the video. And thank you very much for supporting my channel and watching my videos and maybe even subscribe to this channel. And I would like to give a special thank you to all our patrons for supporting my work, supporting my tutorials. And if you also consider supporting me, just check my Patreon on Patreon slash Electronoops, select any tire that you want. And like that you will be able to see my videos before the YouTube release. You can get in touch with me with comments or uh, questions. And by the way, I'm also on Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, also our website Electronoops.io. So if you make an account, you will be able to post your projects, your tutorials, teach others your work and also use the forum for, our, for the questions and all the doubts that you have. Thank you once again for supporting this channel, for giving a like to this video, and also by subscribing and supporting me on Patreon.com. Keep up, you guys!